the qualities of an Ayurvedic diet may be a little surprising. The first one is love. The food needs to be made with love. The second is that a food needs to be digestible. I'm Heather Grish, and this is the Wisdom of the Body podcast. This podcast explores the idea of body intelligence as the real key to learning the knowledge of life, or what we call Ayurveda in the ancient language of Sanskrit. We do that by connecting with today's creative leaders and experts who will help you listen to your body, trust your gut, and live in deeper harmony with nature. Come join me as we unlock the golden door to clear, direct perception and become very deep listeners. You can find the Wisdom of the Body podcast on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can also follow us by joining my email at heathergrish.com or on Instagram at heathergrish. I know you're going to love this podcast, so take a second right now to subscribe. Today I'm here with Amadea Morningstar, who works with Ayurveda, polarity therapy, and accessible yoga. She's been dancing with Ayurveda since 1983 as an educator, writer, and cook. She's the director of the Ayurveda Polarity Therapy and Yoga Institute. Her early writing includes the best-selling Ayurvedic cookbook with Urmila Desai. Her recent publications are Easy Healing Drinks from the Wisdom of Ayurveda, and a chapter on Ayurveda and Leninger's Transcultural Nursing, 4th edition, which was written in 2018. She's been named one of the top Ayurvedic bloggers on the web. She's taught at Omega, Kripalu, and Shivananda ashrams, and at home in Ghost Ranch and Santa Fe, New Mexico. In her work as an Ayurvedic nutrition educator, she consults with people around the planet. A registered polarity educator, she has a master's in counseling and a BS in nutrition. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Amade. I'm so excited to have you. Oh, Heather, I'm delighted to be here. You know, you're a beloved figure in our (laughs) Ayurvedic community. And when I was a student, I read one of your books. And thank you so much for the endorsement of my book last year. And I know that also, you know, many of my own teachers and so excited to talk with you today about your Ayurvedic journey and about Ayurvedic cooking and polarity therapy and marma therapy as well. You've been at this for 30 years ago. You wrote the Ayurvedic cookbook. You're like, wait, was it that long? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And 20 years ago, you wrote the Ayurvedic guide to polarity therapy about hands-on healing and self-care. And I'm curious because, I mean, I know how I found Ayurveda, which was, you know, a little about, say, less than 10 years ago, actually, I think maybe around 10 years ago for me. How did you find Ayurveda that long ago in the United States? Yeah, I'm thinking when you say it that way, it does sound a lot like it's all far away. And just side note, I'm just delighted about your work with fertility because applying Ayurveda in health and fertility is such a positive thing. The first discovered Ayurveda, I was about 10 years into my journey as a nutrition educator. I trained it at Stanford and Berkeley in nutrition. And when I came to Santa Fe, people were asking me all sorts of questions about food and I needed to get practical, like how can we use food for healing? And so in the early 80s, I was teaching nutrition at a variety of healing arts schools in here in Santa Fe. And one of them had invited Dr. Vasant Ladd to teach Ayurveda in this country for the very first time. And we were all excited that he was arriving because we knew nothing about Ayurveda, but we heard very glowing things about Dr. Ladd. And the whole process was a wild one because his visa kept being denied. And so for two years, the faculty, those of us on the faculty were waiting to greet him. And when he finally arrived in the early 80s, we were not disappointed. And I was just delighted to be able to sit on in his lectures and begin to reflect on what this could mean in terms of my work as a nutrition educator. And almost immediately, I saw that One of the things that Ayurveda offers us is a chance to work with our own individuality because the Ayurveda that Dr. Ladd was talking about wasn't a one-size-fits-all kind of story. And I was working a fair amount with nutrition and cancer at the time, and I was realizing that for some people, fresh veggie juice was just the right thing for healing, and for someone else, it wasn't at all. And But I didn't really have a clear understanding of, well, how can I help one person 
the same condition in a very different way. So it opened my mind and it was also, I haven't been able to escape it. (laughs) Ayurveda keeps grabbing me back. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say it like that, because I think I found that as well, that somehow it opened up a part of my mind that learning about Ayurveda, and we could talk more about what makes you know something Ayurvedic, but I think opening my mind in a way that helped me understand why people do need different things and in what context. So I think, you know, that's probably why a lot of us found it. Yeah. I think another thing there, Heather, is that the koshas, that there's five different levels of experience that Ayurveda works with, you know, the physical, the energetic, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. And the fact that Ayurveda was so willing to engage with all parts of my life and the people I was working with was really an encouragement to me, you know, because Western nutrition, of course, which is where I first came from, was much more, you know, physically based. And Dr. Lott is also an incredibly beloved figure in our community. And how did this school find Dr. Lott all the way from India? I believe that his manager at the time, Lenny Blank, searched out people in the U.S. for you know and made the con- connections. And wildly later, Lenny and I married. We're still good friends, but he was responsible before Wynne Warner, who Wynne did so much to support Dr. Ladd's work here in the U.S. And before Wynne, Lenny Blank was the person that brought Dr. Ladd to the attention of the healing world and here. And that's so cool. I didn't know that history. I'm so glad I asked <laughs> you that question and then got the Wynne connection as well. So yeah, Wynne Werner, who was one of the founders of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. And I've never met Lenny, but you were married to him. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very small world in some ways. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And, you know, I studied a little bit with Dr. Lod because he was one of our teachers at Mount Madonna when I was there, but not as much. I know a lot of, like, you studied with Dr. Lod for a few years, right? No, actually, people think that, but I got my first pulse lesson from Dr. Ladd in 1983. It was a private tutorial. I went to his house, and over the years, I've studied and read as much as I possibly can, and yet I actually taught at the Institute and didn't formally graduate from the Ayurvedic Institute. So that's another kind of thing. Because I've been associated with him for so long and respect his work so much and have taken whatever I can, people think that I've may have more of a background than I do working with him. Got it. Cool. Well, thank you for telling me that. And your books, I found, first of all, the Ayurvedic cookbook when I was in Ayurveda school and when I was trying to figure out what is an Ayurvedic diet and (laughs) what's going on with my body and how can I eat in a way that will mix better with this sort of chemistry and structure going on inside my own body. I love the way that Ayurveda just makes it simple enough for us to understand without having to look at a bunch of like math and chemistry. And, you know, this idea of having an Ayurvedic diet, a lot of people talk about say, oh, I'm on an Ayurvedic diet, or maybe should I do the Ayurvedic diet? What actually makes a diet Ayurvedic in your opinion? That is a great question. And I think back on the time I was writing the Ayurvedic cookbook, I originally thought I was invited by Lotus Press to write a book about food and nutrition in Ayurveda. And I thought it was going to be the yoga of nutrition. And they said, no, no, we need recipes. We need something practical. So from the point of view of, I had to immediately address what makes a food Ayurvedic because I was coming up with these recipes. And the qualities of an Ayurvedic diet may be a little surprising. The first one is love. The food needs to be made with love. The second is that a food needs to be digestible and that it needs to meet our balance of the doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. And some people may be more familiar with that than others. That those three things said, you know, love, digestibility, and balance, a food that these criteria can be applied to a lot of different kinds of diets. It isn't that you have to be eating split mung and basmati rice three times a day to be able to eat ayurvedically. What you want to do is have foods that suit you, that are digestible for you, and that are made with love and respect. And your body will feed back whether or not that balance is there in the food 
by how well it digests it and how it feels. Lots of times people will feel relieved when they start working with foods in an Ayurvedic way. Oftentimes those will be cooked foods and yet we'll also use some raw foods and later on I'll talk more about that. But if a person can digest salads well in the summertime, we'll work with salads, say, in the middle of the day. And yet if someone gets gas and bloating from you know, a raw foods diet, then I'll steer them more toward foods that are going to be more digestible for them. So the bottom line is, does this feel good for me? Does it bring tranquility and a certain peace of mind to me? And can I digest it well? And I've got folks that some well-known, I think of one yoga therapist that I highly respect, um, who definitely eats Ayurvedically and yet couldn't touch kitchari. It, you know, creates too much bloating for her, you know, so we work with foods that are going to work for her. I'm so happy that you mentioned that because I remember a couple of years ago, I met somebody at one of our Ayurvedic conferences and it was a male. He wanted me to come have lunch with him one day. And he was like, yeah, he's like, I make an Ayurvedic lunch. Come eat it with me. And I was like, wait a minute. I think maybe he's not getting something. Because <laughs> what is that? And does he know anything about me to know if that would actually digest well for me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because we're all different. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I also appreciate the use of condiments. You know, an East Indian family would sit down at the table and the same food would be served, but there'd be different condiments in the center, like a slice of lime or lemon or some coconut or some cilantro. And different family members would add different things to their food to balance what they need. That reminds me of the Rumi poem, Special Plates. Do you know that one? Mm Mm-mm. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to send it to you. I don't remember the exact words. I think you will love it, but it's essentially a reflection on, you know, look how everyone travels from a different place and look how when everyone comes to the dining hall or to the kitchen, everyone chooses a different food. Yes, yes. (laughs) Rumi said it way better than I paraphrased (laughs) it. So I'll have to send that one to you later and include it in the Yeah, that's delightful though, because the divine in everything and the fact that what's sacred for each of us, there's different meanings. And yet we're all sitting at the same table. Yeah. So if a food is Ayurvedic, and you've talked a little bit about, you know, the love, the food must be digestible, and the balance has to mix our meet our mix of the doshas. How do you apply these principles into when you're cooking a food or creating a recipe? Yeah, that's a great question, Heather. And the thing that I focus on the most is the gunas or the qualities of food. So there's 20, 21 different qualities, 10 pairs, and they include things that are part of our everyday experience. So the gunas include things like hot and cold and light and heavy, you know, oily, dry, dense, dilute. And each of those qualities can be used to describe a food. In Ayurveda, we work with opposites. So if we're feeling heavy, I'm more likely to recommend lighter foods and lighter experiences, things that will be enlivening and energy. If someone is feeling too light and ungrounded, I'll be more likely to choose foods that are more a little bit heavier, or a little more grounding or moist. And so First, we look at what a person needs, you know, whether we're, we can ground into bring an awareness of what am I feeling today? Am I hot? Am I cold? Am I feeling light, heavy, you know, cloudy, clear? And from there, we look at what are going to be the balancing qualities in the food. So for example, if we had something like a rice pudding, a rice pudding would be cool, sweet, sweet cloudy and a little heavy if that would be soothing and grounding whereas if i wanted to make that rice pudding something that would be suitable for somebody who felt heavier i'd want to use lighter spices like i might put more cardamom which is light and pungent i might even put a bit of pipoli which is east indian black pepper which is it tastes a lot like regular black pepper, but it has a sweet or smooth after effect. So when I'm looking like when I was writing the Ayurvedic cookbook initially, some of the recipes I even looked at were from Joy of Cooking. And I'd go, okay, so how could we adapt this American recipe to something that would be digestible and balanced for everyone? Does that help a little? 
Yeah, that definitely helps. And I love that you took that classic book, the joy, that classic <laughs> American book and turned it into an Ayurvedic adaptation because obviously for, I think when we're learning as I learned in the United States and for those of us who learned in the United States and grew up on certain kinds of foods, our bodies may not necessarily yeah. tolerate some of the same foods that an Ayurvedic doctor or practitioner from India might be used to eating in India where their bodies have, you know, generationally built up certain yeah. comfort levels with certain things. Like I remember when I went to India, for example, that I was in South India and every meal I ate was painful. It was Aww. so spicy. And I was like, Oh my God, I am really, I didn't realize how sensitive of a person I was until I went to India. I literally at every meal was yeah. in pain. And it was also the time that I learned that because I was so spicy and I remember somebody said something to me and said, okay, go ahead and, you know, cool your mouth off with this yogurt because it's creamy. And I was like, okay, so I grabbed the yogurt and it made it worse. Yeah. Yeah. And that didn't make sense to me because in my mind, I'd always been like, no, no, creamy things make things calmer and cooler but I missed one aspect of that which is the sour taste yes and the sour taste is warm yeah yeah which is why that we pitches can't have too much yogurt or you know that the yogurt can be diluted with water and it you get a little bit of coriander in there to be able to make it more friendly but yeah no I can connect and I also you flashed me back to the Evelyn Hotel and Nani Tal in Uttar Pradesh and they were so merciful because they knew that we Westerners just couldn't take the spice. And some of my favorite meals were at the Evelyn Hotel because they had such a delightful balance of spices and love. And it like it was a refuge from the heat I wasn't used to, you know? Yeah, the heat you weren't <laughs> used to. I love it. I love the way you said that. And you know what I did when I came back from India? I actually decided I was going to train myself to be able to tell <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And then there's another kind of transition where I was so thrilled at how devoted people were. Like I was in different ashrams of Baba Neem Karoli, and this is back in 83, and I came back to the U.S. and I was shocked because the nourishment I'd gotten on the devotional level wasn't here. You know, you'd go to a mall and there wasn't that juju, you know, that you'd have circumnabulating a temple in India. And so I realized that I needed the spice of the sacred more. And I started practicing more deeply here because I needed that nourishment. If you want to create a more receptive body free from toxins, inflammation, and metabolic issues, would it be crazy for you to explore booking an Ayurvedic consultation with me? There's probably never been a more perfect time to do it. Every day you wait matters when it comes to your health. So if you're ready to get your body back in balance, I'll give you a 30-day plan to get you started. Go to heathergrish.com to book a consultation. That's heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H.com. I'm so glad that you brought that up, actually. That's a really good point that culturally in the United States, and I don't know because obviously my experience of India is one little segment because I, you know, too was at ashrams and traveling with more spiritual groups. So there's sort of an intentional bent, you know, rather than going on like a culinary tour of yeah. Tuscany or whatever. <laughs> there is this devotional piece that I also really felt like I gained that I also feel culturally was missing for me. And I don't know if, you know, every American feels that way or many do, but I certainly felt that. And I love how you said that there were certain things that you could bring in to add that devotional piece. I mean, I remember, you know, growing up Catholic, my family didn't do this, but I know other families used to say grace. Yeah. You know, yeah. as ways to bring that kind of devotion in. But you're also talking about the materials that you're choosing and the foods that the specific ingredients that you're choosing adding in the devotion. Yeah, and also love and respect as essential ingredients. So even if we're not stopping to say grace, though that'd be a very Ayurvedic thing, you know, to pause and just may this benefit everybody. You know, may this be healing for every cell and may it help everyone. And on another level, we can bring that kind of love and respect to any interaction. And I'm realizing that when I hit a hard spot in 
say a committee interaction or something that, you know, a bureaucratic kind of everyday work situation, that if I can ground myself and remember love and respect, then the whole thing goes smoother, you know? So it's not just the food, it's also the connections and the interactions. Okay, you are brightening my day. Can I just tell you this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I think you're going to be brightening a lot of people's days with this interview. And you mentioned, you know, it's not just about the food, it's about these other things. And it's also about the drinks, right? And you wrote a whole book about healing drinks. You know, I know one of the things I wanted to ask you about was like juice cleansing and stuff. But tell me about how you use and how you've seen people use drinks as healing yeah. Easy Healing Drinks from the Wisdom of Ayurveda is my latest book. And I partnered with Renee Lynn, who's a wonderful photographer here in Santa Fe. And we wanted to create something that was simple, easy, that anyone could do, that anyone could make. You know, And so the drinks range from vegetable teas, which sound goofy, but it's like, you know, you can make an asparagus tea and then you know, so you eat the asparagus, but you also have the tea water that you can drink the, later. There's all sorts of different fruit smoothies that are balanced from a food combining point of view. Some of them are really rich in omega threes, which are good for mood in terms of chia seeds or hemp or, or flax. And then others are traditional herbal teas. And then I do have a section with fresh veggie juices because spring to fall. For some people, especially if you've got more pitta or kapha in your constitution, the enlivening quality of the prana in the fresh veggie juices can be really delightful. I've got one that's kind of wild. That It's a combination of fresh carrot, beet, and fresh peppermint. And it's to build the blood. It's a rakta enhancer. And it looks wild and deep pink, and it tastes quite sweet. But there's different ways to combine things that can be very fun and really easy. Like this morning I made a rasa tea, which is, I do a like a half a gallon of rasa tea for hydration. It's kind of the traditional fenugreek, peppermint, ginger, a little bit of licorice or marshmallow root sometimes. And I'll do it in big mason jars. And today my husband and I were, were both going, you know, kind of heading out for a hot day. And I thought, well, what can we kind of zip ourselves up with, you know, before breakfast. And so I blended up uh, rasa tea with a ripe banana and, you know, and split it for the two of us. And it was so easy and so tasty. Lots of times people think that, you know, if you're going to make a drink that it has to have some kind of heavy duty concentrates in it. And yet, especially when you're needing something lighter, some of the medicinal teas that make a great base for a smoothie. Yeah, and you mentioned this idea of, you know, this kind of late spring to to the early fall period of where the sort of fire element might be up more in a body for a person and how that's, you know, kind of more of a beneficial time to be imbibing some of these things for a lot of people. And you're making me think also about with women's menstrual cycles, like the different phases of the yeah. cycles even. Do yeah. you have, like, let me just throw out an example like a drink that you would recommend for somebody who's been having like heavy, heavy, very, very heavy bloody periods? Wow. I would have to think about that one, Heather. Actually, the first thing I think about is asparagus, though. Ooh. Asparagus is used Ayurvedically to slow bleeding, in particular hemorrhaging related to the menses. And so Dr. Ladd used to recommend two, three servings of asparagus a day in that situation. In the Easy Healing Drinks, there's a sattvic asparagus. Let me check it out. What was, I love that one. Let's see if I can find it. But yeah, wildly, there's an asparagus saffron milk tea that you can make with either regular dairy or with like almond milk or, you know, a plant-based milk. It's soothing. It's calming. You take it like the week before the period. And at the same time, we might look at some marmotherapy in terms of that. But yeah, so as, asparagus would be one thing I would think of. I love that. I'm so glad I asked you that question. And especially because right now at the time of this interview, it's getting into summer. <laughs> yes. So yeah. that probably could be very useful for people. Yeah. Yeah. And so this idea of, because you mentioned earlier about your initial interest of wanting to go into, to learn about Ayurveda, because you had observed that, you know, fresh certain, you know, raw veggie or things were good for certain people, but maybe not for others. 
What do you think about some of the sort of diet fad things like juice cleansing as an example? What are some of your thoughts about that and how they're being used by people today? Kapha can survive a juice fast a lot easier than a vata. And sadly, the vata in us is oftentimes attracted to extremes. So it would depend on the person and the time. The other thing is, it's interesting, you know, I've mentioned Dr. Ladd a number of times, and I respect his advice and teaching a lot. And he talks about not using raw carrots in the summertime. You know, and this is sort of a small point, but a food has an initial taste in the mouth. And then there's an effect on the digestive tract, which can be, you know, so the taste in the mouth could be sweet, sour, salty, pungent, bitter, astringent, you know, and we can taste that. So that's the rasa. The virya is the effect on the digestive system, whether it's warming or cooling. And then the vipak is the long-term effect. And so even though a cup of carrot juice initially feels cool and sweet and slightly astringent, refreshing, it has a bit of a warming quality. So if a pitta goes on a carrot juice fast for a week or more, they could get fairly ferocious. Their fire could get rather strong. I use fennel in the easy healing drinks for some of the summer veggie juices as a, you know, like the fennel bulb as a substitute for carrot because it's tridoshic and it has some of that same sweetness, but it doesn't rile the mood. That was part of what also really kind of brought me to Ayurveda was the fact that it talks about how foods can affect ourselves physically, but it also affects us on emotional and mental levels. And sometimes those are subtle. You know, we can feel riled because something doesn't digest well, or we could feel soothed because it's calm and familiar, or it just, it feels like it's meeting our needs. But I was really appreciated the fact that Ayurveda does work on, on these various levels, you know, tangibly and practically. I'm so happy that you brought up the carrot example because my partner binge eats carrots. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably won't want to binge eat fennel, you know? <laughs> no, he probably won't. He is quite pitta, so this is... The <laughs> well, you know, that's where I come up with jicama. He binge eats that too! Yeah, but give him the jicama for the summer, yeah, because it's going to be soothing and calming, and yeah, so it's raw, so it's crispy, crunchy, that's all fine. It would be survivable for most people. No, chewed well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's going to love this one. What about some of the other, because we use in the Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia, so many of the herbs that are grown in India or indigenous to India, like, you know, ashwagandha and, you know, many different kinds of herbs. And there, I'm finding that with the, you know, herbs and spices that come from India, I'm sure they've, you know, come in different waves and to different places across the planet. But, you know, we use them, certain ones as spices in our kitchen, like cinnamon or you know, many things that people or even fennel seeds for that or cumin. Some of them are common in kitchens today. And there seems to be like this new wave of herbs that are sort of not necessarily spices that are being used in sort of the general diet now in some of the sort of prepackaged drinks and foods that are being sold by certain companies. I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that. No, it's become very popular just in the last couple of years. And it's a really good point. And there's two points I'd like to make here. One is organic. Only it's been estimated that max two to 3% of the Ayurvedic herbs and spices on the market are organic. And Banyan Botanical and Pukka are two of the companies that have really pioneered making sure that plants are as clean and that the earth is protected as the plants are being produced, as the food is being produced. And so to me, that's an important thing, because if we start getting into using anything on a daily basis, we want it to be as clear and clean and also supportive of the workers as possible. There's the popularity of certain kinds of Ayurvedic herbs as adaptogens, you know, as herbs that help us adapt to stress in everyday life. Some of those are going to be appropriate for some of us and not for others. And so, you know, ashwagandha, you know, is one that if you need some warmth, you know, ashwagandha is a little bit warm. It has some progesterone-like qualities. It does have an energizing effect in the day, and it can help sleep at night. And yet, for some people who are pitta, it might be too warm. And for a few people, 
it riles their mind rather than soothes them. You know, that's a rare circumstance. But I wouldn't just throw ashwagandha in, you know, like any snack or drink, you know, and yet that's starting to be what, what's happening. Turmeric is, in most cases, would be very positive. But in a few cases, if you overdid it, if you had too many turmeric lattes, you might throw off your vata or your pitta. Yeah, I noticed when I was at, I think it was a Starbucks or a Pete's coffee, which is local brand, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. there was like the golden milk coffee or something. Yeah, yeah. And in some ways, that's great in that there's the different Ayurvedic herbs like turmeric or even fenugreek help clear fats from the bloodstream. And so it's like it's, and when we're looking at a country where, you know, we eat 40 to 45% of our calories, you know, from delicious fat, those herbs that are going to help keep the blood clean could be in an appropriately used, yeah. I'm going to invite you to experience some Marma and polarity therapy. Oh, I love that. I was just about to go there. Okay, cool. And anyone that's listening, you can also play with Heather and I. You rub your palms together and bring the right hand to the center of your chest and the left to your belly. And just begin to bring your breath and awareness to these two points, right hand at the chest, left at the belly. And as you breathe in, Notice how you feel in this moment. Just check in physically. Let yourself ground. Come to neutral. And maybe even feel a bit of a sense of spaciousness with the breath. This is a basic use of marma therapy, which are therapeutic points in India, with polarity therapy, which is combining two points in an energetic way. And in this particular process, what we're doing is we're grounding the energy. The right hand sends energy down to the left. You can also use marma therapy to support digestion. And we haven't talked too much about complex food combinations, but there's no shortage of them out there. And there's a few places I'd like to just mention. One is if you bring your fingertips to your temples and gently make circles there, this is a great one for, believe it or not, calming vata and nervous indigestion and gas and bloating. To rub your head in the midst of gas and bloating sounds a little goofy. Then the next place would be just coming back to that navel. And the navel is like the ginger tea of Varma points. It supports our digestive harmony on a wide range of levels. It impacts liver and stomach, spleen, pancreas, small intestine, large intestine. Right now I'm just making little circles at the navel in a clockwise direction, so coming up and then heading to the left and back down or round to the right. And this would be something that if you wanted to stimulate support digestion, you could do before meals just for, you know, a few minutes. At the same time, sending love and respect, you know, to your body, like, okay, body, let's slow down and get simple and eat what we need. And then the last one I think I'd like to mention, well, there's two. One is to bring your right fingertips up to your forehead and gently just place them there. And this is the marma point that relates to mental digestion. And we can work so hard sometimes to digest what's been happening in our lives that it impacts our physical digestion. And if you place your right hand here at the forehead and the left at the navel, it's a way to start calming and settling and enlivening our digestive process as much as we need. The last point I would invite you to experience would be to leave that left hand at the navel and bring the right hand to the top of your sternum, your upper chest. And you can find this point, if you find the clavicular notch, that hollow, and then slide onto the chest, just to the top of the sternum. People with bodywork experience would know this is the manubrium, that first little hollow at the top of the sternum. Just holding your fingers there for a moment. This is a place to calm in terms of emotions around eating. And so it's a way to settle our energies, send ourselves some compassion. It's been a long haul. We've all had such things happening in this last year and a half. And just to send love and compassion to yourself and everyone you know and don't know in this moment. So lovely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amadea. And I don't know if our listeners actually have heard of Marma therapy before and what you just allowed us to experience. And 
it's very similar to probably what a lot of people have experienced in their yoga classes. You know, some yoga teachers will cue the touching of certain points on the body. Could you tell us briefly about marmas? Yeah. I was delighted to be introduced to Marma in the 90s when the Secrets of Marma came out in India. And Marma therapy is an ancient form of healing that was originally created as a defense art for monks in India traveling in dangerous places. And it was found that certain places on the body could be vulnerable, and literally Marma means vulnerable. And yet later it was discovered that these were not only effective points for protecting oneself in a self-defense sort of method, but that used with a healing intention, places like the center of the chest or the middle of the navel or the forehead were all therapeutic points for healing. So these have been used now for thousands of years. And oftentimes if someone has experienced panch karma or an Ayurvedic massage, Almost for sure, the person that's giving you an Ayurvedic massage is very specifically working these therapeutic points as a way to enliven your physiology and your mind and heart. Yeah, and probably people might be familiar with acupuncture in some way or acupressure. Mm -hmm. What I was told from my teachers was that those two practices were influenced by the Ayurvedic practice of marma therapy. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, there's a fascinating book. I think it's by a man named Frank Ross that Lotus Press put out years ago, which compares the development of Ayurvedic marma therapy and acupuncture. And there was also a form of East Indian acupuncture many centuries ago, too. The Tibetans were the characters who brought traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda together about a thousand years ago. They had healing conferences in Tibet where they invited Chinese practitioners and East Indian practitioners to share ideas. And that was the kind of the birth of Tibetan medicine. So there's been a cross-pollination that's been happening for quite a while. Amadea, I am so grateful that we had this time together today. And I love speaking with you. And I also feel like I learned a couple things today. So thank you so much. (laughs) Oh, You are so welcome. It was a delight to be here, Heather. And I just wish you and all of your listeners the best. Thank you. And tell them how to get in contact with you and learn about your work. Yeah, thank you. It's amadeamorningstar.net is my website. And you can see my blog and the different books in the shop. There's Easy Healing Drinks from the Wisdom of Ayurveda and all the different books that I've written. And yeah, yeah, please visit me there. Thank you so much for being here on the Wisdom of the Body. Take care, Heather. Thank you for tuning in and dropping in with us today. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. I really want to hear your feedback. To learn more about my work, visit heathergrish.com. That's heather, G-R-Z-Y-C-H.com. And meet me here next time on The Wisdom of the Body.